Good morning. Welcome to Prayer Lakes Church. I'm glad to be here about yo. We are delighted that you're starting off the week the right way. You are choosing to start this. You know what? A lot of stuff happened last week. A lot of stuff's going to happen uh, uh, next week, both blessings and challenges. But, but you being here right now in this moment, God's going to do something. And you giving God some room is a really, really big deal. So good job. No matter how you got here, the fact is that you're here. So really, really good job. All right. So let's do what we always get to do. Let's get our Bibles out at this campus. There's some on the chairs. Your campus, they might be in the ends or somewhere else. Use your phone if you want to, but we're going to go to the Word. I'm going to go about three different places, maybe four different places. We're going to focus in on some things. So we'll get that done. And here's kind of the other one that we, we always say, but a little, even up the game just a little bit uh, this morning. Um, we always encourage you to take notes, and especially in this series where the first week kind of built to the second week, and now the second week's building to this week. Um, it's really important to take notes. But at the end today, this whole series, we've been moving down to this one spot, right? This one spot. So you're going to need something to write with at the end anyway. So ushers are coming right now. If you don't have a pen, get your hand up, and they'll get one to you, because um, you, you are going to need it, and we encourage you, you to, to do that. All right, while that's going on, let, let's, um, we're just going to kind of crash into this thing because we, we're going we're gonna to do it. This morning's going to be a little bit different than maybe what a normal or regular service around here is. So if you're new, just relax. The principles are all true and stay the same, but we're going to just order things a little bit different. So, so we're in this series called, called Praying for a Miracle. And, and what we've been trying to do is, is we're, we're trying to kind of rescue this idea of miracle. Um, and, and we're trying to rescue it from kind of this, this side that's way up over here that, that, that's kind of the weird kind of people that are, you know, like on TV that like, if you just send in your $100, I'll cry on this hanky and send it to you and you'll be blessed tenfold, right? We're going to, no, no. Then there's this other side over here that's kind of like, well, God doesn't do that anymore or God doesn't act that way anymore or miracles don't happen anymore. And, and so we're trying to kind of bring it back to this spot and, and say, yeah, God still does big things. God still does miracles in the lives of people. And, and, and so we, we're just walking down that, that, that trail. And, and the whole point of this whole series is for us to get to this thing today where we're going to actually say, okay, God, I'm going to come before you and I'm going to believe and that, that, that you're going to respond in, in the way that you know best. And we're going to pray big. And we're going to ask God to do big things, whether it's inside of us or, or inside of some friends of ours or our relatives or our family or our situation or circumstances, we're going to ask God to do something big. And, and so we're going, to, we're going to end our service in that spot. So here's what's going to be different today. What I want to do is I want us to do this thing as a journey together. And, and what we're going to do is I'm going to coach you up and then we're going to practice together um, what it means to start getting yourself ready um, to come before God and, and kind of lay out what your heart is and ask him and, and, and come before him with faith. And, and so whether, whether it's, it's now, whether it's next week when you're praying again for something, um, or whether it's a month from now or two months from now, I'm going to take you down this kind of journey that, that will help you get to the spot where you can be listening to God's voice and, and you can hear him and you can pray what he's asking you to pray. And, and so we're going to go on that journey together. We're going to teach it and we're going to practice it in here. So, so I want you to avoid two things, okay? I want you to avoid the idea that we're just kind of learning today. We're not just learning, we're practicing today. And the other thing I want you to do is as we walk down this trail today, let's walk down it knowing that we're going to get to the end of the service and we're going to give you a card and we're going to pray. We're going to write out what our big prayer is, our miracle prayer is from God. And that's where we're going to go. Okay. So, so let, let's do this. So as we approach God in this way, um, there's some starting points and there's some ending points. And these are kind of what I do and what we kind of teach around here. So I want you to write this down first. Here's where we start, okay? If you're going to come before God and you're going to come before God and ask him for something big and ask him to, to pray, and you're going to pray big, bold prayers. Here's where you have to start. You have to get tuned in, okay? So the first thing is tuned in. And tuned in really is simply this. It's getting my heart and my mind ready to receive, okay? So whether, whether it's now in this moment or whether it's next week, and, and you're, you're in your living room, or whether it's three weeks from now and you're with your small group and you're going to pray together and kind of move to this spot, or it's six months from now when God's calling you to something, you always have to start with this place. you got to get tuned in because there's all kinds of, of, of things that want to move us away from listening to God. And if you're not intentional about tuning in and getting your spot, your heart and your mind ready to receive, you, you're going to miss most of what God has to say. So let's go to one passage together, if you would. Let's go to the book of Psalms, Old Testament. And let's go to Psalm 8. So it's the 8th Psalm in Old Testament. You can't miss it. Uh, big book, 150 chapters. So just thumb through till you find Psalms. 
and then go to Psalm 8. Now, Psalm 8 was written by, by, by David, and, 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 and there's something that happens in this psalm. And this is one of the psalms that I go to when I'm trying to make sure I'm getting kind of my mind and my heart ready, when I'm getting tuned in. This is one of the psalms that I go to. And, and there's lots of them. And there's lots of parts of scripture that help you kind of start to tune in. But this is the one that I like, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. So go to Psalm 8, and let's, let's walk down it together. And let me just show you why, why I think this is a really good one for tuning in. So here's David, and here's what he says. He says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Now just take a time out just for a minute. Remember in the New Testament where, where the disciples said to Jesus, they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. And so that's how we got the Lord's Prayer, right? And remember how the Lord's Prayer, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be what? Your name. And here's David, Old Testament, way before Jesus actually walks the earth, promoting the same and teaching the same principle. That when you come to God, you've got to come with this in mind, that his name is above your name. That, that, that my mind and my heart need to get in the right and proper position. And here's the right and proper position. You're God and I'm not. You're going to be famous. I'm not going to be famous. You need glory. I don't. Your name needs to be lifted up. Mine doesn't. And, and so go back to the psalm and listen to David. And he says, you, talking to God, you have set your glory above the heavens. Through the praise of children and infants, You've established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've set in place, what are mere mortals that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You've made them, us, a little lower than the heavenly beings, and you've crowned them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds, and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Then he ends with this, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. So my friends, listen, before you, as you begin this journey and you start to go, okay, God, I want to I wanna tune in. One of the best places to start is a passage like this that moves you out of the way and starts to move God in the way. And notice what happens here. David immediately goes to this. Your name is above. Your heavens declare. Here's who you are. And he gets up out of the weeds right away. And so the question that we have to ask when we start to get tuned in is this. What's keeping me in the weeds? What's keeping me from seeing and hearing clearly right now? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to practice getting tuned in right now, okay? And, and so here's what that looks like. The first thing that I do, go to a passage like this one, and here's the first thing that you do. You identify distractions, okay? What's distracting me right now in this moment from tuning in? For some of us, it's as simple as, oh, I got to remember to, I got to remember to put this in the oven later, or I got to remember to get this on my calendar. For others, there's something big on us right now that we're saying, I've got to make sure I make that phone call. So what's distracting you right now from tuning in? If you're worried about a game or something, it's, it's going to be there. If you're worried about, it's going to be there. But identify right now, what's distracting you? What's distracting you? Just, just for 30 seconds, what is it? Something you need a calendar? Something you need to just get off your mind. So I always identify. Then here's the second thing that, that, that I do. I, I park the distraction. I park it. So when, I, when God shows me, like I'm worried, about, I'm worried about not forgetting to call my mom. Instead of trying to remember to remember that, I park it. Here's what I do. I carry these cards everywhere I go. And on these cards, I just write stuff down so I don't forget. So when I sit down to be alone with God, I have a card and I have my pen. And if I need to go, okay, that's bugging me, I need to remember to call or I need to remember to do, I just write it down. And then it's off my mind, I park it. And when I've got the parking place, 
then I don't think about it anymore. I can tune into God. I'm not worried about remembering. I'm not, I'm not worried about forgetting. I parked it. So right now with your pen, what do you need to park? What do you need to park? Just write it out. You put it in your phone. Pull your phone out and put it in your task list if you need to right now. But let's eliminate, let's identify the distractions and let's park them. So let's do it right now. Just park it. All right, so let's, then, then we just, you just pray. So Father, we just, God, we, we hand these distractions to you. We write them down. We can pick them up later. Help us to tune in with our hearts and with our minds. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. So as we, as we move to the spot where you're going to boldly come before God and ask for things that maybe you've been afraid to ask for, and be brave in it. We start with tuning in. Here's kind of the next step that needs to happen. It's confession. Confession. So as we move to this spot where you're going to be listening to God and stepping boldly where he wants you to step, we, we've got to do this, 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 practice this thing called confession, which is admitting that my sin that is both public and private. And because it's, it's critical that we think in, in both ways here too. Public is the things that I do, okay? The, 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 the things I say that are inappropriate or the, the actions that I, that I, that I do that, that aren't right. That, that's, that's public stuff that other people see. But there's a lot of our sin that's just private. It's that inside stuff. It's the attitude. It's the, it's the stuff that's going on in my heart and the stuff that's rush, racing through my mind. And it's really, really critical that before we move with God, that we come before him and say, you know what, God, I'm wrong. This is a sin in my life. This is an area that I need to confess. And I've got to be square with this. The Bible teaches this principle. That when you have unconfessed sin in your life, it becomes a block in your relationship with God. And when you allow sin to reign in your life, it becomes a block to your relationship with God. Can God work through that? Absolutely. Does God still love you? Absolutely. Does God still want to use you and work in you and bless you? Absolutely. But when you allow sin to go unconfessed, which means I'm holding on to it, and this is what I want to do, then it becomes really a block with God. And let me just really be honest on this. Our God never, ever, ever blesses disobedience. Never. He doesn't bless disobedience. And, 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 and so we, we've got to get to the spot of saying, God, here's my sin, and I, and I, and I give it to you. I confess it to you. Let's stay in the book of Psalms, okay? And everybody just turn to the right to, to Psalm 51. And, and, and Psalm 51 was also written by David, as were, as were most of the Psalms. But Psalm 51 is, is really unique because we get a picture. We get a picture of a guy who's blown it big time, like you and me, like we do. And we get a picture of what it means to confess that sin and admit it. And, and, and so in Psalm 51, we have this picture of David. Now, remember what David, some of you don't, don't know David, but he was a, a, an Old Testament king of Israel, and, and he was really close to God. In fact, God called him his friend. And David was blessed beyond all measure, and yet one night um, he chose to blow it. And, and, he, and he coerced another gal who was married to their man to come over to his place, and he had sex with her and got her pregnant, and then he killed her husband. And it was just a mess, and, and his family became a mess from almost from that point on. But Psalm 51 is when Nathan the prophet confronts David and says, David, you did this and you're wrong. And this is the response of a guy's heart who's been broken. And, and so go to Psalm 51 with me and just listen to how David confesses. Have mercy on me, O God. According to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. So do you see what David did here? He's not shading anything. He's not defending. He's not hiding. He's not looking at God as the God who's going who's to punch him in the face and light him on fire. And he's not looking at God as the God who's going to wake and say, it's okay, big boy. Kind of do your thing. I know what it's like. Nothing like that. 
David's saying, I have blown it, God, and I am dirty to the inside, and I need you to cleanse me. Go farther in it, and he says, for I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. So do you see what, what's happening here? David had took the time to know what was happening inside of him. He took the time to think through his actions. He wasn't oblivious to them, and let's be clear on this right now. There are some of us that run, 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 and we're busy, 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 busy. We've got the music going all the time or the TV's on all the time because here's what we know. If all of this stops, we're going to have to face our sin. And there's a lot of us that don't want to face our sin. And so we run and we run and we run and we keep the noise going and then we keep the noise going and we keep the noise going. And here David does just the opposite. He says, I... I know what I've done. I know who I am. I know what it is. He just gives it to God. And and, and so we're going to practice this right now. We're going to practice this. And this is our time that we can say, we get tuned in, and now we say, God, I, I need to confess to you. I need to confess. So... Here's kind, of the way, here's kind of the way I like to, to do it before God is this. I start with this. What was, what's the first thing on my mind? What's the first thing? When, I, when you heard the word sin and confession, what was the first thing that came to you? Ah, oh, I, I, just today I, I said this, or last night I did this, or, or God's been really working on me. What's the first thing on your mind? What's the first thing? always start with that because you, if you're in tune at all to God you know where you're wrong you know so let's just take a, take a minute and when I started talking about sin and confession what was the first thing that was on you and I want you just to confess that and just lift it to God just give it to him right now in this moment just lift it to him David said, I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. So just give it to God right now. Attitude and action. Just confess, I'm wrong. Forgive me. All right. So it's, it's good to start with those first things. But we, but we can't stop there. The second place that we need to go when it comes to confession is this. Are there, are there deeper sin patterns that have got their hooks in me? Is there a deeper sin pattern? For instance, am I living my life in fear And fear is determining all the decisions that I make. Am I living my life in shame? And is that a pattern? So all my decisions and all my relationships kind of stem from that pattern of shame in me. Or is there just a sin pattern that just keeps erupting on the landscape of your life? Anger, hopelessness, sense of failure. What's the sin pattern? What's below the surface? And if you don't know, two suggestions. God, reveal it to me. And if you do know, and this has been a pattern for a while, you need to let, keep confessing it, you need to let somebody else in with you. Hey, you need to help me with this, hold me accountable. I keep falling in this arena, in this area. So let's take 30 seconds. And just give that to God and ask God if you need to. Go. Sin pattern, the deeper sin pattern. And confess it to Him.
What is it? Just get that right. Let's bring it to God. Now, let's go to one more step now, one more level. Not only the kind of the surface, the first things that I just, I just know I'm wrong. I got to confess that. And then what's that deeper sin pattern? But there's, there's another part of this that I think is really important for us. And it's, it's this. What lies am I believing? What lies am I believing? And what lies am I believing about God? If you live in the world that says, well, God doesn't love me, then you're believing a lie. You're living in a sin pattern of a lie because the Bible says God does love you and he's proven it on the cross. If you believe that God doesn't care about you or has forgotten you, then that's a lie that you're believing. It's a lie because the Bible tells us that God knows every hair of your head and he knows exactly who you are and what you're going through. What lies you believe in about God? In and like that, what lies are you believing about yourself? I'm worthless. I've got nothing to offer. This world will be better off without me. Those are all lies because God says the exact opposite of those. God says you're valuable. I paid my price of my son. You're so valuable to me. Now, worthless, you're valuable to me. You've got a mission. I've got adventures for you to be on for me. I've got jobs for you to do. I've got a plan. I need you to participate with me far, far from being used up, far from not having a purpose. The God of the universe has a purpose. And if you don't believe that, you're believing a lie. So just take another 30 seconds. Are there any lies about God or about you? that you've been believing. Confess those right now, go. I confess, I confess the mess, the things I did in my distress, the backward strides where I regressed, I confess. I address the stress, the quest to beat a heart depressed that steered me to my sin success, I confess. I obsess in less, settling for beneath the best, inferior life that infests, I confess. I suppress truthless. I run and hide when I transgress. Deceitful and scared, lest I'm test, I confess. I profess that yes, I repress my finessed unrest. Get off my chest the brokenness, I confess. But nevertheless, I turn to you for my progress. Submit to your expressed request, I confess. You possess my rest. My hope for joy lies in your breast, not the sins where I live depressed. I confess. To you, I confess. So as we move to a spot where you can hear God's voice more clearly and you can discern his will for your life, and you can pray big prayers with faith and confidence. We get tuned in and we identify why I'm not tuning in and we park those things so we can give God our attention. We confess our sin. Here's the next spot that we need to go to. It's, it's the spot of surrender. 
and, and, and surrender and submission, it, it's, a, it's a real simple word. It's a simple statement, but it's the key to everything. If you're going to be a follower of this Jesus, surrender is the issue. Am I going to surrender my will to him? Am I going to surrender my right to him? Am I going to surrender my agenda to him? And surrender becomes the key issue. And surrender really is just this, giving to God what belongs to him. When I surrender, I give to God what belongs to him. And part of what we have to do is we have to understand, what am I holding on to? What am I gripping tightly that I'm refusing to let God either have or be a part of with me? What am I white knuckling? What am I hanging on to? Just uh, this Wednesday or uh, Friday, I was coming back from a board meeting in, in Orlando. I'm on a board and, and I was flying back and I, and I said, okay, God, I'm, I'm surrendering this trip to you because my, my goal would be I want to sit in the chair by myself. I want to read my book and sleep if I can and just shut up and be alone for a little bit. But okay, God, if you want me to talk to somebody, I will. I surrender my rights to my comfort. And so I get in the first leg from Orlando to Chicago, and I'm on the inside, and these two gals come sit down. They're both from China. They don't speak a lick of English. It was awesome. <laughs> Didn't have to say a word. How you doing? Okay. Get on the plane in Chicago to see the rapids. I sit by a guy. And he starts to share how his life just stinks right now. And we spend an hour, an hour and five minutes or so in and I just shared with him what it means to love Jesus and what Jesus, how Jesus loves him. And this whole concept of what it means to surrender and let, let God be in control and how hard that is. And I asked him this question. What do you think you're really in control of anyway? Well, I'm a, well, I can, well, <laughs> that's the right answer. You don't control anything anyway. And that's the whole key here. Understanding that you don't control it, so you can surrender it. You can. Everybody turn to Romans 12 with me really quickly, okay? Romans 12, it's the New Testament. And it's the, it's the sixth book into the New Testament. So you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, then you get Acts, and then you get Romans. And Romans 12 just has this, this one phrase from Paul. That, that it's, it's just key to this principle. And, and in Romans 12, verse 1, and I'm only going to read verse 1, okay? Romans 12, verse 1. Here's the key. And so, so Paul says, therefore, and whenever you say therefore, you know, you ask, what, what's he talking about? And just before this, he's talking about how great Jesus is and all that Jesus has done. And he says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is true worship. So, so hear what he's saying. Here, here's what I'm urging you to do in view of all that God's done. In view that he's greater than you, in view that he forgives your sin, in view of all of his mercy on your life, offer yourself, surrender yourself to him. And, and he says, offer your body as a living sacrifice. You know, what the, you know what the main problem with a living sacrifice is? It always wants to crawl off the altar and go its own way. And the word he uses for offer is this, to continue to offer it and to continue to offer it, to surrender and then surrender again and then surrender again. My friends, here's what's gonna happen in the next six weeks for us. We're gonna end 2015, and we're asking God to work in big and amazing and miraculous ways in our lives. And we're gonna surrender to him. We're gonna let him be God, and we're gonna let go. One of the greatest tools that we use in surrender is this, fasting. We're gonna take every Tuesday, starting in two days from now, and there's six of them all the way into 2015, and we're gonna ask you to fast together, all of us. And we're gonna fast and we're gonna pray. And here's what fasting does. Fasting exposes dependencies that I weren't even sure were there. So when you fast, friend, there's lots of ways to fast. So when you fast from food, here's what God exposes to you. Man, if I don't eat, i become a hangry jerk. I am so dependent on something as silly as a Snickers bar. Right? And, and, and I am a slave to food. I plan around food. I think about food. I like food. I, 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 food controls my life and it makes me feel better. And if I don't feel good, I eat more food. And when you fast, it exposes your dependencies. 
And it's a small picture of saying, if I surrender this, it reminds me of who God is. And it doesn't have to be food. It could be, it could be media. It can be, um, like we fast for media for a day. Turn your phone off except for work. Don't go to Twitter. Don't go to Facebook. Don't go to ESPN. Don't go to NeverBroncos.com. Don't go to anywhere. And you're going to realize how, how dependent you are on this thing. You're sitting on the toilet on your phone all the time. You never put it down. And all of a sudden that gets exposed in you. That you're turning to a lot of places. And you're holding on to a lot of things. And it becomes a picture of, of surrender. You may need to fast from talking. Some of you dudes are going, that would be awesome. <laughs> but when you fast, it exposes dependencies. And when a ex- dependency gets exposed, here's what you can do. Surrender it. Surrender it to him. And the second thing that we do when we, when we talk about surrender is this. Always asking this question, what am I holding back? What am I holding back? I'll give a lot of things to God, right? But, but there's certain things that I'm going to hold on to. And we grip them tightly. And the question that we have to keep asking ourselves is this. If I'm giving back what belongs to God, what am I holding on to? What am I refusing to let him in on? And for some of us, it's something in, inside of here. We're just holding a portion of our heart and we're saying, you can't have that one. For others, it's like, you, you, you can't have my, my job. You can't have my, my relationship. You have no business to speak truth into me about relationships. And, and you can't have my, whatever it is. There's something that we're holding back. And God's saying, listen, until you let that go and you let me have it, it's not a surrender. So, so here's what I'm going to ask you to practice with me right now. We've been doing this for a couple months now, and it's the sur- surrender prayer. And if you're new around here, I'm going to teach it to you right now. I came back from my retreat time, and, and I really think God spoke to me. And he spoke to me in this way spoke to me in this way that I hold on to way too many things and I let things bug me and I, I, I have fears that I hold on to and I have pride and ego that just grips me and there's certain things that I'm really willing to say oh it's all yours God and there's certain things I say there's no way that one's mine and so I came back and we've been doing this prayer and that prayer is going to lead us at Prayer Lakes Church the next 10 years so I want to just practice together right now okay so put your pen down put your pen down Lay your stuff on your lap, but just, just do this with me. There's, there's, there's some movement to it, okay? So do this with me. Ready? Put your hands just on your heart like this. Just put your hands on your heart. This is the, the center of, the, of your emotions and will. And this is your heart. And say, Lord Jesus, I surrender my heart to you. Let's say it out loud together. You ready? Lord Jesus, I surrender my heart to you. Just let him have it. Hurts and pains and aches and joys and fears just... All that stuff that resides in your heart. Now move your hands to your head. Look at me. Move your hands up to your head. Like this. In the second place, we need to surrender our minds. So let's say it together. Lord Jesus, surrender our mind. Ready? Lord Jesus, I surrender my mind. And for some of you, this is it. This is the, this is the spot that just, it's crushed. It whirs and rolls and boils and never stops. It's the seed of a lot of trouble for you. So it's time to surrender your mind, have the mind of Christ, not your own mind. Finally, or or then third, third, go like this, put your hands like this. Almost like you're dead, you're in the coffin, right? And this is your body. So it's Lord Jesus, I surrender my body to you. Ready? Lord Jesus, I surrender my body to you. Just all that I am, it's yours. This is this is, this is for you. This is for your work, for your glory. And then just raise your hands like this. See, the universal sign of surrender, just raise your hands. And this is simply, you're just saying, Lord Jesus, I surrender my whole life to you. All that I have, all that I am, just surrender to him. Surrender to you. And that's what you pray. And you, you pray that and you just constantly are surrendering. There's something else that we do and we do it every week. We do it every week in this place. And, and we, we surrender what Jesus says 
is the greatest competitor for our hearts. And the greatest competitor for the hearts and the last thing that most of us are willing to let go of is our money. And so every week we, we have this thing we call the, the offering. We give our offering, our tithes and our offerings. And it's a picture of surrender. So ushers, would you come down now? All the campuses, ushers, come down. And, and we're gonna give our offering and tithes right now, but I want, you just to, I want you to take this to a different spot right now, okay? Every week, this is a picture. Every week, this is a picture. Whether you put something in the bucket, whether you do it online, whether you do it withdraw, whatever, however you do it, here's the picture. I am surrendering, I am calling you God. I'm giving you what's most important to me. You know, of all the things that Jesus could have said, he says this, that this thing called money is the number one competitor for your heart. And every time you do this, every time you, you tithe, you're saying, I surrender, I surrender, I surrender. And, and honestly, I'm gonna be square with you right now. If you're thinking um, Prayer Lakes is just doing a money grab, uh, here's what I want you to do. I want you to give your money to somebody else or some other church or some other organization. You do that, you tithe. Because it's more important is what, what happens in your heart, not what happens to our bank account. It's your heart. And if you think we're ripping you somehow, or you don't trust us, give it to somebody else. Give it to something else if you don't trust us. This principle is that important. Because if you're gonna come before God and you're gonna say, God, I'm, I'm asking you, Father, I'm asking you to move big. I'm asking for this miracle and yet you're not willing to surrender the, really the simplest thing, um, it, that's just a bad spot to be in. So I'm begging you to be, a, to be that kind of a person, to be a giver, to be a tither like that, because it's the picture of surrender, picture of surrender. All right, so let's go to just one more spot very quickly and then we'll move. The fourth area that you have to go to is worship. You have to worship God. And worship is simply this, proclaiming him over me. And, and when we say worship, you know, our mind immediately goes to singing and song, right? And there's, there's reason for that, okay? There's reason for that. But worship has all kinds of forms. But here's the essence of, of worshiping God is this. I'm proclaiming you, God, over me. I'm, I'm not equal with you. I'm not the co-pilot. You're the king and I'm not. You're in control and I'm not. You're the king and I'm following you. And that's when we worship, that's what we do. And, 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 and when we worship, here's, here's what we do. And when we do it in here together, we gather together, it's like, oh, we gotta go sing. And uh, okay, but listen to me, listen to me. This wasn't our invention. And it isn't the modern 21st century church's invention. And it's not the 12th century monks who invented this. Listen, when we sing and worship, we are participating with the angels in heaven, whom the Bible tells us at this very moment, they are doing exactly what we do on earth, which is with our hearts, with our voices, we proclaim that God is great. We're participating with the angels and all the ancients of all the time, every brother and sister from time immortal to this day does the same thing. They say, God, you are better than me, I proclaim you, amen? That's what worship is. And the second thing that worship does is this. It's telling the truth about God and about us. So when we sing together, every song that we sing is, is scripture. It's from the Bible. It's truth about who God is or it's truth about who we are in relationship to God. Everything that we sing. And the third thing is this. We engage now. We engage our hearts. Listen, I, don't, I can't sing. I'm a horrible singer. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Right? I, all right, listen to me. Most of us disengage when it comes to this kind of worship because we think, oh, my, my voice is so bad. I don't want anybody to hear me. Listen to me. Your last concern is what somebody around you thinks of your voice, and your last concern is what you think of somebody else's voice. Your only concern is this, that God deserves my worship whether it's from a rotten voice or from a voice that actually sounds good. God deserves it. And so when we worship, that's, that's what we do. That's what we do. So when you're alone or you're together, part of getting in tune with God, part of confession, part of surrender, this has to be the next part. I'm giving God worship. And whether it's over your headphones or with your voice, you worship him.